Hello. Recently we received guidelines from the bishop concerning reopening the churches for in-person worship. It was made very clear that we were never closed, but the buildings were closed. We've continued to worship this entire time, but now we've been given the opportunity and criteria with which to open our doors and allow people inside. Rather than sending you just a copy of these guidelines, I wanted to be with you and maybe expound on them a little bit, uh, just so that if you have any questions that you might be thinking at home, perhaps I'm going to be able to answer them, but if not, at least you know that I'm here and you can call me with any questions or email me with any questions or concerns that you have. The following guidelines are to be followed for the resumption of in-person worship at churches in the Episcopal Diocese of Oklahoma. Every church in this diocese has to abide by these guidelines. They pertain solely to principal worship services. So any midweek services or gatherings um, of the like have to be approved by the bishop or won't happen. Um, those that would be approved would be uh, something like a midweek Eucharist or something like that. We still won't be doing any kind of one-off services or fellowships. Um, in the time between the issuance of these guidelines and the resumption of worship, Congregations are encouraged to prepare by acquiring the necessary supplies to address the, require, the required sanitizing protocols. We have currently put sanitizer stations in, all around the, the church, both affixed to the wall in hand pumps, um, and, and foam, in the foam hand pumps, and then we have bottles of sanitizer placed around as well. Um, congregations are not required to presume resume in-person worship if we cannot meet these guidelines or have concerns for the health of the church members, the staff, or the clergy. Any clergy who identifies as a vulnerable person is not required to participate in resuming worship. Clergy and congregations are encouraged to consult with the bishop if there are concerns or questions. We have been closely tied with the bishop in contacts uh, of, of our context and we have been made aware of all the, the things that, that we had questions about. Now, of course, I am happy to forward any questions that you have if I don't know the answers on to the bishop myself. Um, it says here that we can be aware that these guidelines may be modified or worship suspended depending on public health conditions and guidance by health authorities or public officials. Basically, if there's an uptick in the COVID uh, cases around our communities, there could be a, a potential closure of the churches again in terms of in-person worship. But let's move to the pre-worship preparation, which is number one. Uh, churches are encouraged to continue virtual worship as an option. Episcopal Church of the Resurrection, we will continue worshiping online uh, even when we do resume in-person worship. I feel like we have learned a great deal about how to reach people in our community and I don't want to lessen that by simply throwing it away because we're back in person. We never know who's at home who needs the word that that we're reading or speaking or who needs to see people uh, because they won't see anybody else that day. Persons considered as vulnerable due to existing medical conditions or advanced age should consider virtual worship in lieu of in-person worship. I cannot make you stay home. I'm not going to police you. However, if you have underlying medical issues that might put you at deeper risk or at greater risk of COVID and from COVID, I would encourage you, as is the bishop, to remain home. And the advanced age is a portion of that. We never want to seem ageist, but in this, COVID does seem to harm those of a higher age than those of a lower age. And so I would, I would ask that you heavily consider not coming back if you are falling into an age range that makes it more dangerous for you. Anyone experiencing any signs of illness should not attend in-person worship. That's a given. So any signs of, uh, of illness, nausea, headaches, I mean, and anything that you could think of that might be misconstrued as something else, we don't know the full breadth of these of these uh, symptoms yet. And so 
any kind of illness also puts you at more risk for getting COVID. All persons attending worship are encouraged to wear masks. I cannot make you wear a mask. But what I'll say about that are a few things, actually. Masks, even the cloth ones, um, keep us safer. Because this virus travels in droplets, when we speak, when we sing, anytime we exhale, if we don't have something covering our face, then that puts other people at risk around us. Now, the N95 masks will keep us safe from getting it from someone else. Cloth masks actually do a little bit of that too, but not, not to the degree to which the N95s do. But what cloth masks will do is they will, if we have it and don't know it because symptoms don't show up sometimes until 14 days, they'll at least keep people around us safe until such time as we know that we have it and then we stay at home. Masks aren't just about us though. They're about the people around us. I feel like love your neighbor as yourself really comes into play here because if we're not willing to wear a mask to protect those around us, even if we don't agree with the fact that they save or not, we do so because those around us might believe that and it might give them some peace of mind and it also might just save their life. Again, I can't enforce it, but June Howard has made over 60 masks for this church and each of you will receive one as you come in. And I've been promised that she has plenty of elastic and cloth to make more. So we'll never run out of those. And I really encourage all of you, if you choose to come back to in-person worship, to take a mask upon entering the building if you don't already have one. All churches must be thoroughly cleaned and sanitized prior to the resumption of in-person worship. Hand sanitizer stations should be established throughout the facility. Bathrooms must be stocked with sanitizer wipes to be used when entering and exiting the doors. All pews, altar rails, entry doors, and other common touch areas will be sanitized prior to resuming worship. We have a cleaning crew that comes in every Saturday and they take great care of this place. We will also be sanitizing the building Sunday mornings as the clergy arrive we will wipe off doorknobs and we will make sure the pews have been wiped off as well and anything that you might touch in the, in the lane from the front door to your pew. There's a bit about churches having multiple services, but I'm going to skip over that as that does not apply to us. If you have more questions about that or would just like to see it, it's section F under, it, it's, not, it's section F under section one. Arrangements should be made to prop open entry doors or designate someone to open them for people as they enter into the building. This will be done by our ushers if needs be. The front door is already prop open so we can just hold those open for people and we won't have to worry about that. However, many of us park in the back and we come in through those doors so an usher will be placed at one of those sets of doors to open it for people as they come in. Please wait for the door to be opened for you before you enter in just because the less touches, the less likelihood of spread. A stationary offering plate will be in order. We're not going to pass the offering plate from pew to pew. Um, the less touches, again, uh, will, will help to you know, not spread contamination. So we'll have the offering plate in a place where you'll know where it is so that you can leave your offering and, and go in safety. Holy water and baptismal stoops will be devoid of water. This one is, is hard, but it makes sense. If it travels through droplets, it must do more so in water, period. Plus, you know, every hand that touches into that water has potential contamination. So we have to be careful with that. I do believe the water is holy. I do believe the, the water in the stoops is holy. However, I also believe in safety. And the bishop is right on with this one. And quite frankly, with all of these. But I understand that the holy water presents a danger to us if we were to all utilize it at once. Nurseries, youth rooms, uh, fellowship halls, classrooms, any gathering space that we have in here that is not the nave, the sanctuary, is not going to be used. We're not going to have a nursery program or a youth program that is going on site. 
Now, the youth are meeting. They're meeting once a week with Rose, and they're having a great time. They're playing charades and doing all kinds of crazy things, and they're still getting to see each other electronically. While that's not the same, it's something for them to have. But for the time being, and probably well into the fall, that will be the case. No beverages or snacks will be served here before service or after service. As much as we all love gathering for coffee hour afterward to talk about each other's week or maybe what's coming on up this week or what's going on in our lives, we have to remain socially distant from one another and we also have to be careful with food so we can't serve it. And coffee will not be provided by the church. Now, I'll tell you this, coffee can come to the church but not be shared. So if you have a thermos, bring it in. That old war about having coffee in the sanctuary is going to go away for a little while. If you want to have coffee, you bring it on in. Thought, pews, chair rows, seating of any kind should be roped off or designated in some way for allow for, pro, uh, for proper social distancing. Every other pew in this church will be blocked off. Family units, household units, because people live together that aren't necessarily family, um, household units may sit together, of course, but they must sit six feet away from the next household unit. So if a family of five is sitting together six feet away, that's the next family, and so on and so forth. Even if it's just you, and I, I, I'm sorry for this, and I know that that would make lonely, uh, lonelier worship because you'd be so far away, but at least you'll be closer than you have been. So you'll still be have to sit six foot, feet away from the next person if they do not live with you. We'll give some thought to how we'll announce that capacity is full. Given our church and the way that it's set up, I don't worry about that so much because of our congregation size. Our nave seats 200. We have around 120 on Sundays um, at our at our you know best, and there are going to be people that re remain at home. So this part doesn't concern us just as as deeply as it might someone else. For the worship team and clergy under section two, the worship team being clergy, staff, and lay leaders, anybody experiencing any signs of illness, including clergy, should not attend in-person worship. If I get sick, I will not be here. If Dion gets sick, he will not be here. Um, if a lay reader or anyone is sick, they cannot come to church. Each worship team member is going to have to have their temperature uh, taken before service. So the clergy, we will all take our temperature prior to arriving to the building, and so will the lay reader and the acolyte, of which there will be one each. So in order to avoid multiple microphone um, speaking and multiple touches by acolytes, one acolyte and one lay reader will be, will be all we need. But temperatures will be taken before service just to ensure and, and maintain an extra precaution. Uh, all worship team members will wear masks in this church. Uh, that's, that's, not a, um, that's not up for us to kind of say, well, I really don't want to. We're going to do that because we're all up on the altar and we need to take extra care for some of the people that will be up on the altar um, that may have issues that could cause them to be more vulnerable to this than others. So the times when masks won't be worn by altar people are going to be when I'm preaching or Dion's preaching or Dave's preaching. When a lay reader reads, they may take their mask off. At all other times, masks will be worn during the altar party, uh, by the altar party during, during the service. The social distancing practices will also be used during vesting, so we'll do that in, in turn. So if you're a lay reader and you see somebody in the vesting room, just wait, let them get vested, then you go in and do yours. By the same token, after you've worn an alb that day, take it home with you and wash it. If you cannot do so, give it to me and I'll do it. I don't mind at all. But that way it's clean and ready to use for the next person. Social distancing practices also at the altar will be observed. So unless you live together, um, so if we have an acolyte whose father or mother or brother is the lay reader, then that's fine. They can sit together. 
Uh, even Deacon Dion and I will not be sharing a bench anymore. So we'll all be practicing those social distancing um, things while we're up there. For people attending worship, anybody experiencing signs of illness, again, we need to, we need to stay home. If we're sick, we stay home. And it's restated here because I think it's important. People who are vulnerable due to advanced age or due to other issues need to stay home from worship because it's not over yet. And we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and also that we keep an eye out on those who we want to take care of as well. We will miss these people who, who aren't here. We'll miss the young and old and everybody in between. It's not an easy thing, but it's the right thing. There is no physical contact whatsoever while in the building between each other, unless you live with that person. So this concerns even when you get to the building, no shaking hands or fist bumps or elbow rubs, um, no hugs, but a wave, you know, remaining the feet apart that you need to and grabbing your bulletin from the usher who will have gloves on and a mask on uh, and go into your seat. That's that's what we've got to do to ensure that we can maintain the distance that we need to. All people attending worship um, will receive, uh, again, a bulletin from a gloved and masked uh, usher or another designated person. If the usher doesn't feel, if our ushers don't feel comfortable coming back, we'll find somebody. For worship, music is a big part of this church. It's, it's huge. Uh, music is, I dare say, I have to say half, because if I say 51%, then I'm giving too much ground. But music is so important to us and part of our livelihood here, and it too has its restrictions. Um, when we sing, the droplets from the water in our, in our air that's expelled, they actually go further because we push harder. So singing, actually, instead of six feet, now we're looking at 10 to 15 feet. Because of that, choirs have to remain six feet apart per person for the entirety of the service facing away from the congregation. Um, now ours is located a little bit differently, so because it is you know, a good 10 feet behind the first pew, we'll be fine there. However, our choir will be limited to four people. Eric knows this, Leon knows this, and the choir knows this. Um, we have not selected four people, and it may be that we rotate them. I will leave that decision up to Eric as he is our music director and he's our music minister. He will minister that. But uh, the choir is limited at this, at this time. The second part of this is that congregational singing is discouraged completely. Because of, again, the expulsion of, of air, we, we have that, you know, even though we've got people a pew apart, that's still less than that 10 feet. And even with a mask, it's a little dangerous. Now, humming, singing along, you know, I mean, we do that anyway. We don't really know the words to anything. So I think that that's fine. But out loud, push, forceful singing is discouraged at this time. I've already talked about the altar party. So let's move on to communion. Communion is going to be of one kind only. It'll be bread, and it'll actually be wafers. We're not having any homemade bread in here, as you can imagine. It would come from somebody's house, and that's just one more touch than we need. I was informed earlier that we have over 800 wafers, so we have plenty to make it through. Um, but wafers will be the way that we do communion, and there will be no wine. If we have wine, it will be solely um, consumed by me. But my thought is, if you go without, I go without. Communion is going to be done by standing stations. So I'll be standing at the front, and you'll walk up with your family, and I'll give you communion. And then you'll go sit back down, and the next group will walk up, and the next. And the ushers will let you out as, you, as we move along with that. But kneeling and touching the altar rail is also a danger. We would have to sanitize in between each one, and even then, we wouldn't be certain that we would get everything. So it's just safer to do a standing station. I know that I love to kneel during service, especially during communion. I take communion kneeling uh, when I can, but the grace is still there in that communion and 
the meaning is still there in that communion, even if it's a standing communion. We, uh, we will have to refrain from touching communicants' hands when I give communion. So doing this, you'll get it dropped in. I'm not going to throw it to you or at you, but I will, I will not touch your hands as I do this. I will also not be wearing gloves as that makes no difference in between um, communion and or in between not wearing them with regard to communion. I will be the only person that touches the wafers every day. So I will make sure that Deacon Dion is right behind me with sanitizer and you know every every five or six people I'm going to be sanitizing my hands to make sure that we're being as, as cleanly as possible. Only the celebrant will administer communion. It will just be me. We will wear a mask while distributing communion. That might be a little off-putting, but it, again, it's for your safety. Uh, I hope that you understand that. Following a, the, a, a communion, only one person will clear the altar. This is mainly for the lay reader. Sometimes we congregate over there and we can't do that. So that'll be just the deacon. Deacon Dion will be the one clearing the altar from here on out until uh, we, we get some of these restrictions lifted. The announcements are going to be said just by me for now. Now I know that, that that hurts a little bit because we like to hear from our brothers and sisters from the congregation. I love it when Pam Dean gets up and says something or you know when Helen tells me about ladies lunch that I can't go to. But for now, to avoid multiple people speaking into the same microphone or to avoid multiple people standing up and projecting from where they are, um, if you have an announcement prior to worship, please let me know and I'll be happy to do it to deliver that announcement for you for birthdays anniversaries and wedding blessings or I guess anniversaries and weddings are the same but for any kind of blessing during service we'll still offer those you'll walk up and we'll remain apart and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you a blessing and say a prayer with you and then you'll walk back to your seat after worship we're not going to gather in, uh, in any way um, so after worship it, what it is, is it's basically just kind of getting up and the ushers will release you row by row so that we're not all kind of getting up and airplaning um, and just standing all scrunched up. The ushers will release you pew by pew and you'll be able to go out. Um, I encourage conver conversations in the parking lot and I think that's the first time you'll ever hear me say that. Usually I hate parking lot conversations just because I don't get to be in them. But um, I encourage you to you know speak from car to car. You know That's plenty of feet away. Uh, and also, I can't control what you do in the parking lot, but I know that you love each other and you want to see each other. Please don't physically touch, but I encourage those those moments in the parking lot out in the open air. Um, all the vessels, all the lapel microphones, all the all the vestments, everything will be cleaned and sanitized after every service, and we'll make sure that we do that. Altar Guild is going to be, have to be down to one person um, a week, and if that uh, if that becomes a, an issue where it's not enough, we'll we'll re we'll revisit that and move move forward. But for now, Altar Guild. I know there's a lot of people that like to go up and help and clean up after service, but that'll just be one person a week and myself. I'll help, of course. But uh, for now, that'll just be that one person. Um, the staff and the clergy are, are still encouraged to work from home as much as possible. I know that us not being in the building and you not being able to call us on the landline is kind of difficult, but uh, you can still call my cell phone and email works great and I'm happy to text. I mean, all those uh, options are still available to you. So uh, know that um, we'll be working from home as much as possible just to keep ourselves from bringing germs into the building in between services. Any vendors or visitors during the week are gonna wear masks while they're inside. Uh, groups. Uh, the vestry and I are discussing groups uh, such as scouts and others um, and we'll, we'll have an, uh, an answer for you soon. So those are the guidelines. Um, a few added things I think I want to tell you about that you should expect. You know, you received a survey today alongside this video that's going to help us determine whether or not June 14th is the right day for us to return. I can tell you that in the Oklahoma City area, 
only three churches are opening up on June 14th. Of those three, I have no opinion about that. I think that they know their context best, they know their people best, and their people know what is best for them. There are also age restrictions at some places where there aren't at others. And so I think that we need to decide what is best for us based on our context and our community. So I've written a survey and I really need you to fill it out because it's gonna inform me as to what you think about everything. There's room for comments. I've asked questions about almost everything. It's not gonna take you forever to do. I mean, it's very user friendly. And if you have any problems with it, please contact me because I need to know what you think. I don't wanna make a decision and the vestry doesn't want to make a decision alongside me without hearing from you first because this is your church and as such you should have a say in what happens i will take into account everything that's said and then the wardens and i along with uh deacon dion we'll meet and we'll talk about it and we'll see what we're seeing uh from the statistics and, and the results of that survey and we'll make a determination then i send the survey out tomorrow so for one week, I will wait. I will wait and give everybody a chance. You'll have seven days to fill out that survey. At the end of seven days, I'm gonna compile the data and that's when I'll meet with the wardens and Deacon Dion. We'll have a discussion. Then the next day, we'll meet with the vestry and we'll tell them our findings. And then as a group, we will discuss whether or not June 14th is the right fit for us to, to reopen the church to in-person worship. The vestry met last night and I read these guidelines to them and we went over them together and it was hard. It was very difficult to be in that, that space knowing that, you know, when I see Bob Rydell, all I want to do is walk up and shake his hand and maybe say something snarky. That when I look at, you know, Ellen McWilliams, I want to run up and give her a hug or Mary Lou Adams or Mary Greer, any of them. Insert your name here knowing that our worship has been restricted like this is hard, but we also understand that it's necessary. The cases in Oklahoma are still on the incline. Now, it may not be rapid, but it is going up. I think that we need to take that into consideration alongside everything else. I hope that we can all agree to be kind to one another as we offer our opinions and as we offer counsel to each other and as you offer counsel to me and as I speak to you. Without a doubt, we are gonna disagree. And without a doubt, there are going to be opinions all, all along the spectrum. But as we do everything else, I think that it's the most important facet of our lives that we remain Christian in nature and that we remain kind, especially right now. So while you may not agree with your brother or sister, or while you may not even agree with me or your vestry, I ask that we live in the tension of that disagreement and that we can do so in love and charity. I'm not asking you to be happy about the decisions, but I am asking you to be supportive of one another and to not tear each other down. There's enough, there's enough of that going on in the world right now. Right now, we need each other more than ever, whether that's by cell phone or text message or Zoom. So let's be kind to one another. And finally, I wanna talk about the gatherings that are being offered right now. We have the Wednesday night gathering at seven o'clock on Zoom, and we talk, we just talk. It's updates. I say a little bit for about 10 minutes and then kind of open it up for questions or somebody will say, hey, you mind if I say hi to, of course not, say hi. People waving to each other in Brady Bunch style windows and it's pretty fun. And then at the end we have Compline, which is a sense of worship together where we can see each other. On Thursday evenings, Deacon Dion, except for this Thursday because it's Memorial Day weekend and he has other things he needs to get done for work and for family. But on Thursday evenings at 6.30, Deacon Dion is conducting a church history course. It's really, really good. I know seminarians and priests and aged priests that don't know as much about history as Deacon Dion. And some of those things I'd have to include myself as much as I don't want to. Please attend that if you're 
if you're wanting some education, it's a lot of fun. On Sunday mornings, we've started a lectionary series. And so what that is, is the readings that you hear on Sunday mornings are part of a lectionary. It's something that's been given to us by people who have organized the weeks of the years, and we always have four readings that, have given, or that are given to us, an Old Testament, a New Testament, a Psalm, and a Gospel. Now, sometimes the New Testament, or the Old Testament is the New Testament, like right now we're reading Acts instead of Old Testament, but that's a one-off. Anyway, on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, we're discussing those readings. How better a way to engage into worship than to attend that and then watch uh, the, the worship service and say, huh, we talked about that. That makes more sense. Deacon Dion and I are both leading that. He'll be away this weekend, but I'll be with you on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Those links are all in your newsletter, the same place you got this. I know it's overwhelming, but this is the only way we can communicate, and we don't want to under-communicate. If we over-communicate, at least we know we've done our job. With all that being said, this isn't an easy time for anyone. But I think it can still be a joyful time. I think it can still be a time where we can grow as both Christians and as family. I think that we can see one another through a different lens. And I think that we can continue the work of Jesus Christ that's been put before put before us. If we support one another, encourage one another, and build one another up, there's nothing that we can't do, whether we're in this building or not. Thank you for your time today, and thank you for being a part of this family. I love you, I miss you, God bless you, and I hope to see you soon.